Hello everyone, I'm Danny Roddy and welcome to the Generative Energy Podcast. I wanted to introduce you to two of my friends, Jeremy Stewart and Brad Abrahams, the directors of the upcoming film On the Back of a Tiger, a film painting an alternative picture of the workings of life and its profound effect on the nature of disease, aging, nutrition, and consciousness. In this hour-long interview, I chat with Jeremy and Brad about who they are, their journey making the film, and why they need your help on Kickstarter for the film to materialize. Jeremy and Brad have an active Facebook for On the Back of a Tiger, as well as a website, perceivethinkact.com, which both go over each of the interview subjects in more detail. Without further ado, here is my interview with Jeremy Stewart and Brad Abrahams. Brad, how did you guys meet each other? Well, we have somewhat similar pasts. We both worked at a pretty renowned production company and advertising agency, but in different offices. I was in Seattle and Jeremy in Chicago. One I used day, to come out to the Seattle office. Yeah, you know, and several and times a year. Jeremy saw me on the at the time. This was years back. On the like world's healthiest food website, and he was like, <laughs> "Oh, you you go on that website too." I was like, "Yeah." And then we started talking about like antioxidants and rosemary. Is it W H <laughs> Foods? Is that the website? <laughs> yeah, I think that, so. That yeah. Was the site, and we both realized that you know we had the healthy food neuroses, and <laughs> we talked for <laughs> hours and hours on end about you know the latest things we'd read or self experimented with. And this was you know before really any of the major you know dietary or, or lifestyle swings that we had started to make. So you guys ha- have that friendship. And then how did that manifest into doing a documentary together? Yeah, it was years later. We were just friends who had similar interests and worked together on and off when I would be out on the West Coast. I think it was the last time that we worked together, which was years ago now, that Brad had just found uh, Ray Pete and shared the website with me. Brad, what was that experience like? Because I know a lot of people don't just immediately go towards Pete. Did you try a lot of different dietary philosophies before that? I had. It was a a pretty long and torturous route. But I had always had like really horrible digestive issues as well as, you know, allergies and fatigue. Tried a lot of different things and decided that something drastic was in order um, and decided to go raw vegan and mainly fruitarian which I did for years and noticed, you know, pretty, pretty big positive impact on my health. But for a lot of reasons, that diet and lifestyle didn't stick. And I was sort of looking for something that made a little more sense in, you know, the modern age, as well as with, you know, my own sort of particular physiology uh, and lifestyle and stumbled, I think it was through your site, you know, right. certain key keywords and, and queries. And somehow I, I came to your site, read some of your writings on Pete was like, this guy just sounds so strange <laughs> and fascinating. <laughs> and at first, I think like a lot of people, I started reading his site and I was like, oh, he's just crazy <laughs> and, and wrote it off. And then a little bit later, he sort of came back to us like, May- maybe he was onto something. Um, <laughs> And, and sort of broke, I think there's a threshold for everyone reading Pete where it, it just clicks and everything starts to fall into place and, and make a lot more sense. And so that finally happened and it put a lot of my own issues in the past in context. And it was really actually kind of empowering once sort of realizing the, the fundamentals of things like, you know, the stress response and how that was causing a lot of my issues and then how you know, that could be mitigated. So yeah, that was my introduction to Pete and how I got acquainted with him. And then when I, when I introduced Jeremy to him, I was still sort of in the beginning of, of that yeah, was, journey. So we started at nearly the same time getting into reading his articles and becoming familiar with the, the growing community that was online. And it was still at least, I would say, a year or more before even considering making a film on the subject. What was the breaking point? Did you see the momentum online and then your guys' own interests just kept going and then you decided to make the movie? It was partly, at least for me, that working in the commercial world for a long time, it's a great place to hone your skills and get good at design and filmmaking and things like that. But it's ultimately artistically pretty unsatisfying, Hmm. at least for me. As well as ethically. Yeah. (laughs) So I think we both felt like We'd been using our using our powers for evil instead of good. 
and just becoming more interested in doing independent work on something that seemed more meaningful. And that was happening at the same time, maybe somewhat influenced by Pete's writings. I think just learning about the weird quirks of the communities online and the people, you know, becoming obsessive about reading and discussing Ray and him as a mysterious figure. I think we started throwing around the idea of making a documentary on the subject somehow. So you get an idea to make the documentary and then what became some of the major challenges for actually producing the film? So originally, Jeremy mentioned the idea of making a film that focused more on Ray. So we just emailed him. Once we we had talked a lot about, you know, angles and, and what to say to him, we emailed him and told him the basic idea. And he was like, yeah, sure, give me a call, which we did. And he sort of steered us in a different direction to, or inspired us to look at the bigger picture and tell a larger story. And I, I think that was the smarter idea for us, something that I think will reach a lot more people and also potentially spur more change than a documentary just about Ray, which is for a you know, admittedly smaller audience. And once we realized that it was like a real can of worms being opened, so many more ideas and personalities and theories and just sort of grew the scale of the project. Yeah, the small scope got large really fast. I think when we first had our call with Ray, we were kind of skirting the, the concept of it focusing on him exclusively because we weren't sure how he'd feel about that. We didn't want to be like, Ray, we're, we want to make a film about you. <laughs> <laughs> So, we, you know, in talking about the science, I think he helped us to see that bigger picture. And, you know, it's been a discovery process throughout doing research and contacting people and trying to see the larger web of connections between all of this work that's not well known in the mainstream. Also, Danny, just to backtrack a little bit, when you mentioned our our work and, and skill level and experience, that was also part of the motivation, feeling yeah. confident that we could take these concepts and ideas that are, are very difficult for the public or mainstream to wrap their heads around or even accept because they're so counter to everything that's taught and disseminate them sort of in a way like you do with your blog and what other people do with their blogs and make it more digestible, appealing, and draw the connections for them. Yeah, it was something that you said to us, Danny, when we interviewed you, was that you didn't see anyone doing an adequate job of diving into this material. And so for us being interested in it for a long period of time before that, and being filmmakers, storytellers, visual artists, whatever, it's, you know, there's there's like no video of these people. There's no content in the way that is digested and shared today. And it's like, how people learn about things now. Most of this information is so obscure and hard to get at, and it seemed like a place where I could actually like meaningfully apply the skills that I've gained to do something that I would be interested in and it seemed like it needed to be done. It's been, it's been really heartening to see the response to the things that we've posted already, and that's just the core community. We think that it'll gain a lot of traction with people who haven't even heard of, you know, Ray and some of these scientists, like just sharing with friends who just have a bit of suspicion that what we're taught isn't really everything or that there could be an alternate model or way of thinking for, you know, how we think about life, how we think about consciousness, how we think about physics, how we think about all manner of biophysical things. I think it'll appeal to a pretty broad subset of people. That's the hope. We're mm -hmm. trying to get that messaging clearly understandable. There's really three components to the film, and I think each appeals to a different type of person. You have the criticisms of the establishment, which anyone who's got a, a bit of an anti-establishment bent to them is going to gravitate towards. Then you have the theories themselves, which the peak community and some of the alternative health groups will enjoy. And then focusing on the people like you, as well as people who have, like we mentioned before, taken their health into their own hands, I think, then reaches out towards people that may know a loved one or a friend or even themselves that have some kind of illness that that they've never satisfactorily been able to to treat or you know had a plan or had even hope for overcoming it so yeah there's a lot I think there's a lot to dig into for a lot of people so at that point you guys do the most ambitious thing imaginable and you fly to London was that the result of talking to Hillman and Mei Wan Ho before other people we just started emailing these people. So we listed who would be the core group of interviewees based on people that Ray frequently cites, as well as who we just had like a personal interest in, and then just fan out and, 
and knock them off one by one. And so we emailed each one individually with a very brief email describing the project or our intention for the project, which, is, which has changed over time. And without fail, first response back was pretty much like, yes, this sounds good. Let's work out a time, which yeah. sort of shocked us because, you know, they don't know who we are. And they're fairly where they were at some point. Some of them are now, but fairly prominent scientists. We then realized that they don't get to have a forum for their ideas, especially, you know, Harold Hillman and Gilbert Ling, who have almost no online presence whatsoever, or one that can be like easily sought out. So I think that that everyone was actually very enthusiastic to be a part of this. That was a real like blessing for us at first and also motivation to that we were on the right track and, and to yeah, keep just no no resistance from any of them and lots of interest. I guess London came about because there were several people there that we wanted to talk to. So it seemed like an effective first trip to go knock out a couple interviews at once. You guys traveled to Guildford to meet up with controversial British scientist Harold Hillman. What was that whole experience like? Um, so he, you know, we, we spoke to him on the phone and emailed. We went to go meet him at his house and interview him in his living room. Yeah, he was our our very first interview and it was it was pretty inspiring to meet him. He's like an incredibly generous, humble, sweet person. We we'd already shared a, a a list of questions with him, so there was a lot of preparation before we ever got there. Yeah, he he had printouts of pages of answers already and had thought in depth about each of our questions, which was nice to be greeted yeah. with. And just for listeners that aren't familiar with him, he's similar to Gilbert Ling in having an alternative model of cell biology. He does have a a model, but he puts less emphasis on that and more on the fundamental problems with how we discuss and teach the workings of and structure of the cell. His main point being that almost everything we study is an artifact because of the processing that goes into preparing a slide or preparing it for the electron microscope. So if, you know, nine out of 10 bodies that are most frequently studied don't really exist, just think of how far off course we've come to, to try and figure out disease, nutrition, the fundamentals. Hillman, while he's got, you know, theories on what the cell might be like and what we mainly talked to him about was his evidence-based research on the various techniques of microscopy, as he says it. And like he made these films that just show like a time-lapse preparation of the cell where it's just like on the left, you see the living cell untouched. It's just like a transparent blob. And then it's like preparing it for a specific kind of slide. Wash it in alcohol. And by the time it's done, it's like a third of its size and all <laughs> distorted looking. It looks drastically different than the starting out live cell. So this is the kind of stuff that it's not him like proposing some new crazy theory. He's just like, look at when you prepare the cell, look how different it looks. You're not looking at what the living cell is doing. And so just by saying that he challenges a lot of people and institutions that have spent a lot of money on, say, building on an electron microscope lab, which may cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And Hillman says the preparation process to just get a cell under an electron microscope is essentially changing it so drastically that calls into question the things that we've learned from that. The consequences for him was more silence because you could never, or his opposition could never really argue with him because it was so easy to show each of his theories in a concrete way. So what ended up happening was they would just leave the room when he would walk in or run, <laughs> a, like literally run away from him, take his funding away, take his positions away, not publish his books, but never a rebuttal you know, serious rebuttal that he couldn't take apart. I think it was just something that was just too dangerous for them to deal with. It's like threatening to their position. And meanwhile, and he's literally one of like the sweetest guys you could yeah. ever imagine. I mean, he's he's one of the co-founders of Amnesty International and he left Amnesty International because they weren't democratic enough of a organization for him. He told us about in the forewords to one of his books that he was saying he was thankful that some archaic law in England had been taken out for punishing heretics. That was no longer in effect. And now, you know, you could freely share your ideas. And then like a week after his book was published, he was fired from his job <laughs> for, for, for his ideas. <laughs> what, what was the time span? Were you guys with Hillman? And then when did you meet Mei Wan Ho? Uh, it was about two, two days, days with Hillman. Yeah. Yeah. About two days later, we went to Mei Wan's home. She has some just incredible images of the bifringerance of organisms. Did, did you guys get to see any of that? Not firsthand, just uh, just the videos she's taken of it. She's essentially retired. She just runs her science magazine. So we just met her in her home and, and talked about her work and, and career and her discoveries. 
We first wanted to focus on the, uh, you know, quantum coherence. She's also a fan of Gilbert Ling. Talking about water, the crystalline nature of an organism, looking at them under polarized light microscope. Talked about genetic determinism and neo-Darwinism. It was a pretty broad interview. And then we also uh, filmed her doing her, her artwork. Yeah, and she does not separate her art and science. They each interweave with the other and inspire the other. And if she ever has some sort of intellectual block scientifically, she'll just go paint and come back and it'll have worked itself out. Is that going to be a theme in On the Back of a Tiger? I don't know necessarily a main theme, but it's definitely sort of subtext for a lot of these people is for her, it's a relationship with her painting for Gerald Pollock. It's with, you know, just being out in nature and looking out at water. Each person sort of has their own hobby that they can't really separate from their science. And I think also just the the nature of their work and their findings show that there really can be no separation between the two either. Yeah, it's a, a creative field for them. Just to go back to, since you mentioned the title of the film again, and talking about Hellman, it's something that'll be seen in the trailer, but that's where the name comes from, is Hellman told us what he said was a Russian saying, that it's easier to get on the back of a tiger than to get off it, as a metaphor for the whole scientific system. And why people don't even want to listen to him telling them that their whole field of study and interest is useless. <laughs> when, <laughs> once you're on the back of the tiger, you can't just get off, get out of your position. He said that what? during his interviews, lots of people would come up to him afterwards and say, that they agree with him, but they can only agree with him privately. It's not something that they could come out and agree with professionally. And then before you left, you guys met up with Phil? Yes, he came over. We had been in contact with the idea to interview him. And I think he was a little bit reticent about it, um, about how it would fit in, you know, him not being a scientist. You know, we explained that we, as much a part that the scientists play in this film, health seekers and disseminators of this information play just as important a role. We decided to just meet up with him. He could gauge us and our ideas, just have a sort of casual conversation and see if he wanted to participate. So he came over, we chatted and hit it off pretty well. It was, you know, one of the first times besides Jeremy, just like meeting someone at our age that was interested in all these fringe subjects and ideas and really could talk for hours and hours with him. Just like when we met you on one of our other down days, we filmed him, you know, we talked to him about how he got into thinking about science in under this sort of unique lens, as well as hearing in his own words, how he sees the theories of Hillman and Ho and Pollock and all these other people sort of interweaving. And then we filmed him doing yoga and meditating. And then we got ice cream together. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good afternoon. And then you guys go to Seattle in May and you meet up with the water wizard himself, Mr. Gerald Pollock. Yeah, he's really incredibly open and positive and, you know, welcomed us to come into the lab. And it was a pretty exciting environment to go into. All the young people that work for him and hearing him talk about his creative inspirations and their sort of out their work on water. I don't know, when did we first talk to him on the phone, Brad? Oh, uh, that was way back in, I think, like February of last year is when we right. first chatted with him. Yeah, and he was just super, super excited that some young media savvy people were interested in his work. Because while, while he has made appearances, you know, podcasts and on YouTube, it's, you know, it doesn't look good. And the audio is always <laughs> bad. You know, his face is like right up into the camera. So I think... He was also excited just to be have his work and himself sort of represented professionally, too. Yeah, I knew some people that just because uh, Mercola had interviewed him just wouldn't even talk about what he was researching. <laughs> yeah, that, it's, it's too bad because I think the same personality trait that makes him less controversial also ends up causing, I think, some toxicity with the relationships and that he's open to chatting with anybody mm -hmm. and being interviewed alongside anybody. So it can be him and then, you know, someone who could be like a total charlatan, but he's open still to having like a discussion and not really openly challenging or calling out any specific claims. So I think by association, maybe a little more dangerous with that personality trait. And it was, it was actually um, Gilbert Ling who got Gerald thinking about water having, or at least water in the cell, having different properties than the water in the glass. So speaking of Gilbert Ling, you guys head to Philadelphia on June 19th and go to the Mount Airy neighborhood and then you share a space with a family of friendly cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's that's, yeah, that's accurate. We've, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, yeah. Mo- all of our stays have been the cheap way for us to be somewhere is find an Airbnb. That way we can have a refrigerator and. You know, it's a more effective way to travel with all of our gear. This is skipping ahead a little bit, but one of my favorite moments was hearing you two talk when we were with each other. And one of you is like, man, do you have the carrot? And you're like, Brad, you're like, yeah, dude, I got it. You're like, got to have the carrot. (laughs) uh, That was like not being used to hearing other people talk like that and like being concerned about a fridge to put that stuff in. I just thought that was funny. Shooting and road snacks (laughs) that we have to have our cheese and carrots and orange juice. You guys meet up with Gilbert and just how was that like? We went to his house the day before the interview just to meet him and ended up sitting there for like five hours as he just talked, which was to be the theme. He can speak without end, like hours and hours and hours and hours, whereas we're exhausted already after (laughs) an hour of listening. (laughs) Meanwhile, he's like nonstop, almost without break except for like a little nap, speaks on the most like complex subjects and at very high volume. Like it takes a lot of energy to yell, but he's yelling <laughs> the entire time because of Because his, of his, his hearing is hearing. mostly gone. He, show, he just showed us around and we were kind of shocked. You know, he's 95 or he was 95 then and lives in three-story house all by himself, like a rambling yeah. three-story house. He's like constantly running up and down the stairs, running outside, gardening, walking around. And he's always running, it seems, like never walking. <laughs> and either in constant motion or constantly talking. It was it was just so shocking to see a 95-year-old man able to do that. And one that lives alone, too. You know, a lot of older people, when they lose their partner, start to deteriorate. But Gilbert still seemed to have all his faculties besides his hearing. I've watched that high Gilbert Ling clip like at least a hundred times. <laughs> that one was really popular. Uh, yeah, I think he was, you know, excited to have someone to actually talk to who was interested in his work. I think mostly at that time, you know, he lives alone. He had some contact with his neighbors, but no one who wanted to hear about the big work that he's done in his life. One of his neighbors was maybe a heart surgeon or something. And okay. he said that he attempted to read Gilbert's book, <laughs> but couldn't understand it. So he was pretty shocked that he was like, why are you guys here <laughs> filming Gilbert? His books always start off like, oh, yeah, I can do this. So like, no problem. Right. And then they just just go into a territory that's just it's very challenging. One of the big difficulties for Gilbert is that he is so intelligent and has such a strong grasp on the chemistry and physics of what's going on that he speaks at such a high level. It's hard for most people to keep up with him. Even Mei Wan Ho said that she had to read his book like five times till she fully understood all of it. And she's a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> After that, you guys journeyed to Sudbury and you met with one of the most interesting people, Michael Persinger. And, and yeah. this was when we talked to where I mentioned before choosing our core group of interviewees for, for this beginning round of filming. Persinger was more someone, I think Ray only mentioned once or twice, but someone that Jeremy and I had both had an intense interest in or an intense interest in his work and saw a lot of connections with the theories of the other people we had spoken with, but it was more a rogue decision to interview and and integrate him into the mix. Yeah, I I guess I was surprised how relevant everything he had to say when we interviewed him was to the project, more so than going into it. It was like awesome that we were going to get to talk to him. And And maybe try the God helmet. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) Just for those people who don't know, what's the God Helmet? Uh, what's the original name of it? It was oh. it was dubbed the God Helmet by a reporter. It was like the Koran Helmet. Koran Helmet, yeah, who was another neurologist. They did an experiment using mild electrical electromagnetic stimulation of the right hemisphere, which is where it had been determined that religious psychedelic experiences seem to be highly related to right hemisphere activity. And so they set up this room... Was it a scooter helmet? Yeah, yeah, a bicycle helmet or scooter helmet. It's sort of an iconic looking yellow 70s helmet with racing stripes on it. (laughs) And they put these little electromagnets on it. It's hooked up to a computer. And so you sit in the dark room and they run the program. And a number of people experienced some sort of uh, a feeling of presence that was then filtered through their through their cultural eye, their lens of if they were religious, then they might have had like a mystical religious experience of feeling like God. God was in the room. For other people, it was more just like a presence, something that definitely seemed to have a strong effect on consciousness for some people. 
And so he said he gets up to 100 or more interview requests every year, but every single one starts with them saying they want to try on the helmet. You know, that was work he did decades ago and has moved far beyond that. And it also is, you know, it's sensationalist and a little more lower common denominator type of reporting. He, I think, understandably wants to distance it from anything that just focuses on the controversy surrounding that. And he was more interested in our, I think, the critiquing of the scientific and medical establishments, you know, the reasons why some of these contentious theories aren't coming to the surface. And, and it's because of the endemic problems in the establishments and that he speaks incredibly eloquently eloquently about. Yeah, and I think part of his intelligence and, and being so savvy with media, he's just aware of the fact that a major change, a paradigm shift, can't come through the establishment, but has to in some way come through media. So I think the email that we sent him, you know, piqued his interest in, in doing something that was media savvy, but not a sensationalist thing looking at his experiment from 30 years ago. Does he have kind of like a Pollock position at the, the university where he works? Is because he's not challenging anybody directly? He's kind uh, of no, just... no, they, I think they really sort of dislike the fact that he's even in that like city. Huh. <laughs> they, they've tried to run him out of the, out of Sudbury before in the past. He's got enough pull with the right people to at least keep him untouched for now. You guys met up with him at 1 a.m., and that was <laughs> yeah. towards the end of his workday? To get there, we had to drive in from Toronto, and it was a long drive, and so we, we always like to scout the location that we're going to be at shooting. Meet the person, see the space, so we can be somewhere prepared for what's going to happen on the actual shoot day. With getting in so late, we didn't know if that was going to happen, and so we called him up. He said he'd be back at the office later. <laughs> and if we were like those kinds of nighttime kind of guys, we could come meet him. <laughs> and so we were like, yes, I guess we should go meet him. I, I think it works for him on multiple levels. He manages to have like the university basically to himself and his department. Mm -hmm. I, I think he starts his day at like noon. That's when he wakes up. And then he doesn't go to work until like towards towards the end of a regular school university day and then he takes like a dinner break instead of a lunch break and then goes back and works until like three o'clock in the morning every day and all of his lab staff and students have to adopt that schedule as well <laughs> I don't know if you guys told me this or I read this. He uh, has like a diet of cereal or something. <laughs> well, I don't think it's it's not exclusively cereal, but one of his favorite meals is a bowl of cereal with scoop of ice cream on top that he then puts that was it. in the and microwave. Chocolate chips or something also? Yeah. It's just, like life cereal. Then he microwaves it and then eats it and then like does karate. <laughs> <laughs> I think the source of that is some kind of slightly more sensational video about him from 10, 15 years ago. After that, you guys head to Urbana, Illinois, which, Jeremy, you live in Illinois, correct? Yes, but still many hours away from Southern Illinois. I'm in Chicago. So it's still a bit of a road trip, but it was at least only one of us having to fly somewhere. And you guys interview Fred Kumaro. Yes, the oldest of the old subjects. We didn't realize that it was campus move-in day, so all the new students moving into their residences. So even though we were just a few miles from his house, it took us an uh, obscene amount of time to get there. And so I think we ended up being like an hour late. And to us, it's whatever, no big deal, but <laughs> you, don't, you don't keep Fred Kumara waiting. <laughs> and it took a while for him to, to warm up to us Yeah, after we won him over. I wasn't very familiar with him, but he is the mentor to Chris Masterjohn. Yeah, yes, yeah, the first yeah. thing we actually saw when we walked through the door was was a letter addressed to Chris Masterjohn and found out that Chris lived in Fred's basement for like years. <laughs> for like two years before that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he had just recently left, I think, before we got there. And so Fred spent most of his adult life fighting trans fats against the FDA and he got them banned. It was someone else a lawyer, I think, who was instrumental in getting them banned. So Fred Fred had petitioned them for like 50 years and but never got anywhere. I think they're legally required to respond to those petitions. And yeah. the thing was that they just never responded to his petition. And so this lawyer stepped in, I don't know, in like 2013, after he'd been petitioning them forever and basically forced them to deal with it because they were legally required to look at it. And he had so much science behind it. I guess that's what got the whole ball rolling with the ban on trans fats that's now so big. Yeah, or at least the ban on, on certain amounts. But yeah. he went on to say that they there's a lot of loopholes in there that allows 
the food manufacturers to still sneak a substantial amount in, specifically within like cereals and other items. But what wasn't talked about by, you know, the the sort of surge of articles in the media once this got out there was that the same findings or the or the the same mechanisms that or similar mechanisms that the trans fats are bad, polyunsaturated fats are almost just as bad. And to the uninitiated, polyunsaturated fats are fish oils, most of the vegetable oils like flax, hemp, canola, corn, and that these are, you know, almost as destructive in your body as the trans fats. I think it was just maybe the New York Times article sort of mentioned it, but yeah, th- didn't uh, add any detail to it. There's a paragraph in that article, which is probably the in the modern era, the thing that makes him most well known, uh, that touches on, you know, the hardening of the arteries being related to excess of polyunsaturated vegetable oils, and it lists the fats, soybean oil, corn, sunflower. So it's mentioned there, but, you know, in the media, really only they deal with the trans fat label. When we told him that people consume fish oils and flax oil oil. as like a nutritional supplement, he literally shuddered and he he recoiled and and went like, oh, no. He was horrified. And he said, no, people don't do that. And I said, yeah, it's a billion dollar industry, fish oils and and some of these vegetable oils, billions and billions of dollars. And people recommend that you you basically swig them with like reckless abandon. And he's like, but you're going to end up dead with a heart attack. But he just Some, couldn't yeah. believe it that, it, that it was an industry. Can you talk a little bit about his unusual diet and also his age spots or lack thereof? Yeah, well, we noticed that he looked pretty great for his age. Like he, he had like no age spots. He's in a wheelchair now, but that was only in the past few years after a swimming accident, I think at like 97. So I think he's mostly had pretty great health. And I think he was sort of famously known for having like a glass of whole milk and a boiled egg for breakfast every day. With some fruit. Right, with some fruit. He's fine with saturated fat and basically never ate anything that was fried. Fruit and and dairy and eggs, I think, have been a major part of his diet. And he seems to be in pretty great health. And then after that, you move on to the most disappointing of the interviews. (laughs) (laughs) Not true. Some charlatan. (laughs) <laughs> you were the most difficult person to get interested and agree to be part of the project. You know, we were continually we were emailing all of these different people we wanted to talk to. And the, you obviously were on the list as being someone being familiar with the science and also who'd had their own journey with their health. And that that's sort of the other side to the film is the people using this work to take their health into their own hands and, you know, be empowered by this knowledge. You, you know, having a presence and being known had, we wanted to talk to you, interview you about it. I don't know when we first emailed you. I think I, I think I did. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was you, Jeremy. I don't know what my problem was or why I was so uh, kind of resistant to to being interviewed. But I'm so glad I did because not only did I feel like we formed like pretty good friendship, but the whole experience was positive And I just I couldn't have more faith in two filmmakers to to produce an end product that I know will be amazing. So it's kind of ridiculous that I was resistant to the idea in the first place. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we get, we get like sort of like a postpartum depression after each shoot. Yeah. Because the camaraderie and constant social stimulation, and then it's gone. (laughs) You go on this exciting mission where you leave your life behind and go meet like inspiring people and figures. And then it's over and you have to go home. Seeing that we were making something real, that's what won you over? Yeah, you know, over the years, I've been sent emails from people who want to help out. For instance, when I was writing the book, somebody was uh, telling me they wanted to market it in various different ways. And you go through a series of emails with them and then you just never hear from them again. (laughs) So (laughs) I think uh, Jeremy or Brad, I forgot uh, which one sent me a video of, I think maybe it was Hillman and the quality and like the craftsmanship associated with the video was just outstanding. And I was like, oh, these guys are actually for real. <laughs> well, I think it's somewhat understandable in that yeah. the majority of these types of documentary projects or really any film project just don't come into fruition. They just don't happen. They're, they're so difficult to get off the ground and continue and complete that nine out of 10 just don't end up happening. So I think that's where, with a lot of people, the the hesitation comes from. We had a great time. After all the interviews that we'd done, it was fun to go meet someone our own age and talk about all these people because it's telling people about the project we're working on who aren't at all familiar 
they don't know who any of these people are. And it's, you know, it's difficult to talk to anyone about it and sum up the project. But someone like you or someone who's familiar with the work, it's like instantly engaging story. Not to mention that I was there to witness you guys discover that you were actually going to be able to interview Ray. So tell me a little bit about that. I, I guess, you know, it had been on and off. We talked to Ray on the phone a couple times and he'd essentially agreed to be in the project. But then he's extremely helpful communicating with people and very positive. So it was easy to get him to say, OK, but actually setting a time and a date to have a shoot with him was starting to seem impossible. Sometimes it would be like three months until we would get a reply back. And in between, we would send, you know, just checking in type emails. But it was it was becoming clear, at least then, that it just wasn't going to happen anytime soon and that we were going to, for now, stop pursuing it. I think we talked about it when I met you guys, and it was like at that point he hadn't responded and you weren't sure that you were going to interview him. Right. Yeah. Uh, th with the whole process of making the film being pretty organic, it, that's when we had to be like, if we can't get Ray, does the film still work? Can we tell all of the story of these people in a way that makes sense and a context without ever talking to him? So that was something that we were starting to talk about at that time and then trying him again since we were already on the West Coast seeing you. And he said yes and agreed to a time. Yeah. And then he was like, ultra communicative yeah <laughs> and incredibly helpful giving us like grocery store recommendations he walked to where our like uh, our airbnb was to check out the area <laughs> <laughs> just like super friendly super helpful he came by you know every day we were there even when we didn't film just overall was i knew it would be impactful but it was also really pleasant which was the, the unexpected He's the guy who is the inspiration for the project from the start. And so for once, instead of us going to our shoot location, we're just like at our Airbnb, like waiting for Ray to show up. And we're like, you know, getting nervous. Yeah, I think we were, I don't know, standing in the back little backyard of the place and left the front door open to crack. Oh, the place was filled with these air fresheners that just smelled awful when we got there. And every room, it was like an overpowering chemical air freshener smell. And we kept looking in like every cabinet and closet. There was like another one stuck onto the wall. So we were trying to air the place out before Ray came over. We'd like took all of those out of the house. So the front door was still open a crack. And then I think before we noticed, he was like up at our door, sort of like <laughs> peeking in through the crack. We just saw that like, a silhouette of crazy hair and, and glasses frames. We're like, it's Ray. <laughs> <laughs> And like, what was that experience? Did you guys just dive into conversation? Yeah, um, pretty much. Yeah. Invited him in and went out to sit in the backyard and just sort of like get acquainted, get him comfortable. Conversation flowed pretty easily. For the first time, kind of asked more questions about us. Something that stuck with me was he was like, you guys seem so well informed. What's your background? <laughs> We're citizen scientists. We're like, we read your website a lot. <laughs> so it was, a, it was an interesting moment. And we, we didn't have such a set plan for the day. And I think we probably talked with him for an hour outside and then asked if he'd be up to go sit down for some interview. We'd already gotten the cameras and most of the sound all set up to be ready to go at any moment. So then that led into a, a few hours of, of interview for the rest of that day. Give me the gist of the interview. Did you guys start off with Ray's background and health and then traverse into complicated subjects? Yeah, we, we started with basically his, his history, his childhood, and in his journey, both personally and professionally, and heard about what led him to such an intense study of biology and biochemistry, what personal experiences happened to him that spurred that, and just learning. That it was all stuff pretty much that, that he'd talked about before, you know, some health challenges that he had had as a child and as an adult as well, being the main impetus for experimenting or self-experimenting on his health. But instead of noticing him at 25, he noticed him at like five. Yeah, that's the deal. <laughs> he was reading philosophy books and the encyclopedias at four years old or five years old, <laughs> understanding and thinking about incredibly complex subjects at, at such a young age. Did he speak to like kind of that uniqueness or how that wasn't? No, I, I think he, he does lend some of that to his upbringing and in, in that, you know, I think I'm not sure if we, we put it in, up in one of the clips, but basically his parents created an environment where he would find answers for himself. There wouldn't be any sort of predefined doctrine or religion or political outlook prescribed to him. It, he was free to explore that and ask any questions that he wanted to ask and 
and that led to a very open and stimulating environment. I think, I think for any just, child. Yeah, right. And his parents, I think, were fairly creative. I think his mother was a painter. Father was also a photographer or painter. And and they grew up on their uh, some homestead land, sort of in the desert of California. Uh, so I think it was a pretty like free, open unstructured environment. I think at one point he described them, his parents, as sort of like proto-hippies. I think he called them co-conspirators in uh, yeah. one interview. <laughs> at one point, you guys inform him of his cult-like following and, and <laughs> that what was he said? After the very end, af- after we'd gotten through the interview, we had sort of a basic structure to organize the questions that we sent to everyone. That's sort of like about their background, their work and findings, and like the response to that. That sort of basic format was tooled specifically for everyone for their questions. With Ray, we wanted to get as much as possible why we had time with him. So we got through all of that, and then second day of shooting, and as much extra things that we could come up with. And then finally, when we were like losing light the second day after sort of wrapping, we hadn't really gotten a satisfactory answer from him on if he was really aware of the quote unquote community that follows his work. So we showed him, Brad had like a folder on his laptop with like <laughs> screen grabs of various like Pete memes and pictures of people's fridges full of like milk and fruit and brought up a browser with the various Facebook groups and the forum and things like that. And so we're asking him how aware he was of this and and Brad just like showed him some of these things. I think he was pretty surprised. I, I think there was a little bit of shock yeah. to see like when I showed him the group and then, you know, the member count of some of the group close to 2000 people and just some of the interesting adaptations people have made, you know, with their own like infrared light rigs and, and other things. Yeah, it was it was mild shock shock. And then I think the first thing he said was, I should be more careful what I say. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He was, you know, I think it was also a bit of a delight for him to chat with people that know of the same people that email with him frequently because he doesn't have anyone to, I guess, to relate to. The only awareness he has of his sphere on the internet is the amount of people that email him, which, you know, is, is still pretty large, but is tiny in comparison to all the forums and Facebook groups and blogs and and all of that. And so even the idea to him that people talk about a repeat diet, he found like it was confounding for him. Like what would that even be since he's he's never detailed anything like that? I mean, he's talked right. about certain foods that are pro-metabolic or anti-metabolic, but has never said, you know, he's fundamentally sort of against protocols in the first place. <laughs> he was also uh, uh, incredibly surprised that there were like – trainers and people that did things with exercise that based <laughs> their their teachings on his work since he's non-active sedentary he, he said that for exercise he goes skiing once every 10 years <laughs> <laughs> is a, a ray joke <laughs> But back back to the diet, he said that he couldn't really understand what a, a diet like that would be since there are so many variables involved, like your economic situation, your, you know, just access to food, like where you live, for example, your current health state and all of the, you know, minutia. There's so many variables that there could never be a protocol or could never be one diet. I mean, there can be general guidelines, but not you should be eating this and this and this. I mean, we could talk about this probably forever, but <laughs> I appreciate your guys' insight. Let's move on to the Kickstarter and what's going on with you guys with the trailer and everything that we have to look forward to. Yeah. I guess a little more context for the filmmaking process so far. The whole shooting, as you've seen from the blog, has been pretty spread out. That's because it's a really expensive process, time intensive for travel, planning, renting gear. So the way it's had to go is we have to like work some sort of commercial job. That's where we make our money. And so each separately working and then saving up and then going to spend all that money doing a shoot. And then we have to go recoup again and get ready to do another shoot. So it's been a slow process. And we're to the point now where we're getting ready to to release a trailer to give a more cohesive idea about what the film really is, what it'll be like. But to continue and get the whole thing done in a much more timely fashion, we just, we need more money. We need some kind of budget. So that's why we're going to try crowdfunding. I think the fact that there's already a community that's interested in some of these people, I think we have a huge advantage there. So the hope is in a few months, just work continuously on the project instead of just having a few days here and there to go travel and and get an interview in. We still need to get, you know, 10 to 12 more people. And I think what we've probably spent close to $25,000 of our own money over a year. 
That's um, shooting as bare bones as you can. It's just the two of us. We've never hired any crew and we haven't skimped on production quality, but it could be better as well. Yeah. And just having producer and being able to pay people that help us would make for a more pleasant process for all involved as well. And ultimately a better film. And we, we've only, you know, we've shot less than half of our subjects and then we still want to recreate some of these experiments as well as some stylized sequences with the therapies. So studio time and rental for that. And animated sequences are going to be pretty essential in getting across some of the more difficult ideas. Imagining them visually will help with that understanding. So all of that is a added time and cost as well beyond the interviews. We'd also like to get it done while all of our subjects are still alive. One of them's 100 years old. At the rate we've been going, trying to get the film done, just funded out of pocket, it could take a really long time. Needless to say, anybody listening to this, if you want to see this movie materialize, contribute towards it, I'm sure you guys you guys are thinking of cool perks to offer. Yes, and one of them being Ray said he will paint a new picture for... <laughs> for s- <laughs> some lucky for some donor. Lucky, yes, <laughs> lucky donor will get a, a brand new, like, Ray Pete original painting just for that. <laughs> As well as a lot of in- yeah, a lot of interesting things. Some of the Idea Lab supplements. Um, oh, cool! The guy in charge is donating some of his units, and this guy uh, Stephen Scott, who is sort of a specialist in the world of CO two, he's developed a CO two skin cream, and uh, it's it's based off of one that's like really popular in Japan and Korea, but is insanely expensive, but apparently has or is very effective. So we're going to be including a pre release of that some um, consultations with Zachariah Sal- Salazar and uh, Benedicte Mylerche books, lots of like signed books, rare books, some of Pete's books and Hillman's books. Yeah, Gerald Pollock signed Gerald books. Pollock, yeah. Mimon Ho. Mimon Ho's art also, some Hillman books. Organizing the Panic video series. You know, and then the standard ones like access to podcasts or unedited interviews. That, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Is that a plan? Uh, yes. It, it's definitely something that we've heard a lot of people be interested in that for obvious reasons uh logistically providing like 10 hours of a video interview is just technologically difficult uh, i think probably what we'll do is we'll release some sort of most likely audio only interview that's you know hours longer and then some specially selected video yeah. outtakes that don't end up making it or just that clip of gilbert saying hi on repeat <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just like a three-hour youtube version <laughs> i got a lot of plays <laughs> Awesome, guys. Uh, thank you so much. Is there anything we didn't thank cover you. that you guys want to talk about? No, just one little detail I forgot to mention when we were describing our visit with the Hillmans. Harold's lovely wife would bring us tea like every 20 minutes. <laughs> would have like, uh, Yeah, tea or coffee, like a beautifully laid out tray with the pot and the glasses and the saucers and the spoons and the sugar cubes and the milk and everything. But literally, it seemed like every 20 minutes she would... <laughs> Probably wasn't that often, but... It, <laughs> it was just so so sweet <laughs> perfect way to end the conversation <laughs> thanks so much danny no thank I you guys i, appreciate I, I your interest. totally appreciate it i'm as i said i'm completely honored to be a part of this and it, it's pretty incredible what you guys have put together so far and i can't wait to see on the back of a tiger in its full realized state so i, I appreciate all the effort so far thank you so much thanks danny, thanks, danny.